everybody. Good morning. So I'm going to go ahead and turn down the music. Okay. Um, what I would love for us to do this morning, if you're joining us again for a previous session, first off, we'd love to say good morning. Um, and also feel free to take a moment while we're getting started this morning just to tell us where you're joining us from. So I'm going to go ahead and turn down the music as I let everyone know this information. So let me do that. I always forget to do that. <laughs> um, hi, hi Natalie. Oh, Natalia, sorry. So like I was mentioning, friends, so good morning, first of all. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. If you've been with us for some time, welcome too. Uh, we're going to get started at 11.30 or a minute after, but what we love for everybody to do right now is just like you've been seeing in the chat, let us know where you're joining us from. Okay, so my name is Mr. Kengo. I'm one of the educators here at the Science Center, so thank you so much for joining us this Monday morning. We are so glad you're here. I see some comments coming in. Thank you those are, that are leaving us a comment. Hi Jody from West Orange. Hi. Hi Vincent from East Rutherford. Hi. Tara from Tom's River. Natalia again from New York City. Hi Natalia. Hi Vika and Maya from Metuchen. Cool. Hi, Eve and Charlotte from Clark, New Jersey. Welcome, everybody. Hi, Madison from New, uh, from North Bergen. Cool. Oh, hi. Hi, Annalisa. Hi, Vinny. Thanks for saying hello. Hi, everybody. Good morning. So as you're joining us, friends, um, like you've been seeing in the comments, we'd love to hear where you're connecting with us from, whether it's New Jersey or further out, you're always welcome. We're so glad you're here with us. We're going to get started in a few minutes. Um, I see some people are still coming in. So if you're just popping in, welcome first of all. And we love to have you let us know where you're joining us from. Oh, I see some of our friends are from Connecticut. That's awesome. Aliana from New Jersey. Hi Aliana, I hope I said that okay. Oh, so Jennifer, I, I see you said, do we need any materials? Yeah, so what you're going to want to try and grab, friends, if you haven't done so already, we're going to go over those materials in a little bit, but you want to try and grab uh, some kind of container, whether it's a cup or a bowl. Uh, you want to try and grab either some bits of paper, some really cut up bits of paper or black pepper, um, a pom-pom or a cotton ball if you have it, uh, some a pipe cleaner if you have a pipe cleaner, and some other sort of materials like a clothespin. We're going to go over those exact materials so that you can see what the list is. And don't worry if you feel like you don't have those things right now, but you would love to try it later. You can definitely watch this video again later since it will be recorded and saved here live on Facebook. Okay? So I hope that answers your question. Hello, I'm seeing a whole lot of comments coming in. So hi everybody. If I don't say hello and acknowledge you um, by name here on Facebook, please know that I'm so glad you're here with us. Okay, so keep letting us know where you're joining us from. And I'm going to say hello to everybody as they're coming in. Hi Benny from St. Francis Academy. Oh, I got a really nice message. And thank you to all those families and friends that are, have been letting us know that you've been enjoying our content. I got a very nice message from uh, Miss Savage from St. Francis Academy saying that you're enjoying our content. So thank you to Miss Savage if you're watching and everybody that's been letting us know that you've been having so much fun. Hi London from Union. Hi. Oh Finn from California. Wow, that's awesome. Whoa. Marcia or Marissa. Sorry, Marissa from Florida. Hi, Marissa. Amrita. Oh, Amrita from New Jersey. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi, Aiden and Gabrielle. Oh, hi, Ryder. 
Ryder from uh, Ryder and River from New York. Hi, Ryder and River. Cool. I love those names. That's awesome. All right, my friends. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and get started in a minute. But thank you to everybody that's been letting us know that you're here, that the comment box is working. Hi, Rocco. I see Rocco's joining us again. Hello. Hi, Billy. I see a lot of familiar names and of familiar um, friends joining us, so thank you for coming back to join us today. Awesome. Hi, Ezra and Esther from Union. Awesome. Hi, Hazel from New York. Oh my goodness, there's so many friends. That's awesome. Okay, so friends, it is 1131, so what I'm going to do is we're going to get started this morning. So like I said in the beginning, if you're just popping in, you're saying good morning, and I didn't get the chance to say good morning to you and acknowledge your name live on Facebook, please know that all of us here on the sci at the Science Center are so glad you're joining us, and that goes for me as well. We're so glad you're able to join us here uh, for our Monday program. So I'm going to go ahead and switch the screen. Okay, so now you should see me. Hi, everybody. Good morning. And like I said before, we're so glad you're here. Um, and thank you so much for joining us for our Monday program. Happy Monday, friends. So I hope this Monday is treating you well and that you're excited for the week ahead. I'm very excited that you're here today joining us. Um, my name again is Mr. Kengo. I'm one of the educators at Liberty Science Center. So my job is to help uh, teach our youngest audience members from preschool to second grade. So if you're within that age group, welcome. If you're older than that, welcome too. We're so glad you're here. Yeah. <laughs> um, what you're going to be doing, friends, today is a program all about pollinators. But before we get into that program, friends, I do want to mention if this is your first time, uh, joining us here live on Facebook. You might see me look this way. That's just because I want to make sure that I have the chance to see your comments live on Facebook. Okay, so like you've been typing in good morning and letting us know where you're joining us from, I would love to see that and I want to make sure that I'm responding as best I can to all of those comments and questions and good mornings. Okay, so you might see me look this way. All right, just that's just to make sure that I can see what you're sharing and what you're thinking. Okay, friends? Okay, so let's get started. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change the slide or this the view to our presentation today. So this is our pre presentation, friends. Like I said before, we're going to be talking all about pollinators. So we probably know a whole lot about pollinators, right? and um, how important they are to our environment. Now, what we're going to focus on today is the question that's right on the screen for you. Okay, and I like to call these questions a driving question. So if you are familiar with that phrase because you've been tooting into our programs, that's awesome. If you haven't, and this is your very first time, friends, a driving question basically is just a big question we want to see if we can answer by the end of our program today. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and read that question out loud. Um, but if you know an answer to your question, you want to let uh, leave us a comment about what your answer is, feel free to do that. Okay, and I'll check on the comments coming in live on Facebook in just a moment. Okay. But that question today is, how can I take the things I notice and wonder to create a B model? All right, so I'll read that question one more time. How can I take the things I notice and wonder to create a B model? Now, we've been doing a lot of model creation for our programs lately here on Monday mornings. And models are really cool to help explain our thinking about an object, an event, a process, an animal, a plant, all kinds of things. So how can we take the things that we notice and wonder to help make a B model? Okay, so like I said before, I would love to hear your thoughts on this question. If you're not really sure, 
that's okay too. That's still a valuable thought, right? A lot of scientists, like myself included, I don't know the answers to all the questions there are, right? So it's okay to say, I'm not sure, right? And that's a really great thing. It's great that you're here because we're going to talk about it. So hopefully we have a better answer by the end of today. Okay, but go ahead and leave a comment so that we can see what your answer is so far. So I'm going to let my friends try that. Okay, because I know we might be getting used to the computer, getting used to typing if we haven't done so already. Okay, so I'm going to go over here and take a look at your comments live on Facebook. So let me go and try and do that now. So let's see. Hmm. I see. I see some friends are saying hi. Hi, Brady from Jersey City. Oh, I see some friends are saying no idea. That's okay. I see Tatiana saying hi, hi friends. Okay, so I see Annie said that we can look at the picture and create the same thing. And that's a really cool idea, friends. Yeah, that's exactly where a great place to start, right? Sometimes making a model of something is simply just looking at that thing and copying it, or either, either in a drawing way or building something that looks very, very similar to it. And that's a great place to start. Hmm, let's see. Okay, so friends, you know what? Let's start there. So I'm seeing there are some friends that are still saying hello, so good morning again. So let's get started with that program. And I see Landon says that we can make some sticky legs. So Landon, that's a great idea, friend, and that's a lot what we're going to talk about towards the end, because it sounds like you kind of know that bees take in pollen, and they must be sticky in some way, because the pollen it connects to them, right? And that's a great idea. So maybe our model includes something sticky, because we, cause we know that bees collect the pollen, and the pollen sticks to them. So that's a good idea. Okay, so friends, what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and start our presentation. If you're typing in the answer to our driving question and somebody either said what you wanted to say, right, or you didn't quite have a chance to type it out completely, feel free to keep sharing it, right? And I would still love to see your thoughts. Okay? Okay. So friends, what we're going to do is the first place to start is think about what we see and what we wonder, okay, and what we notice, right, because that's part of our driving question. So to practice, I have a slide here that I want you to take a look at, all right, and this is a great thing to practice, friends. So I would love for you to type in a comment to share with all of us what you see and what you notice, as well as what you wonder. So when, when I say, friends, what you wonder, that um, I mean to ask a question, right? So what do you notice? So I might notice that some of our friends have a certain amount of legs, right? Or I notice that some of our friends have these parts on their heads, right, that are called antenna, right? But then that's a noticing, right? A wondering is usually something that involves a question that we want to see if we can answer, right? So go ahead and either you can think to yourself, right, if you don't want to type it in and you just want to think to yourself, friends, that's fine too. Just think to yourself what you notice and what you wonder, okay? And we'll take a moment to do that. So when I n look at our pictures up on the screen, I notice that they're not all the same color, right? Um, I notice that these pictures of, of are things that have, have antenna, right? They all have antenna, right? So let me go ahead and take a look live on Facebook to see what our friends are noticing and wondering. Yeah, yeah. Emiliana had the same wondering, uh, noticing that I did, right? They all have antenna. Oh, yeah. So I see Asia saying that each insect, and you noticed that it was an insect too, so that's like a double noticing. 
each insect is pollinating flowers. Yeah, because they're on flowers, right? And the pollen is also around them, right? So there's a, like three one uh, noticings there. So let's see what else. Um, ooh, I see Brielle said that there's a ladybug. I see some friends. Olivia see, sees pollen all over them. And let's see what else. I see Benny said, I notice all the insects eat from the flower. How do they eat? Ooh, that's a really good question, Benny. Yeah, one of our friends, ha this bee, has a long tongue, right? And that long tongue is drinking the nectar, right? So that bee has a long, long tongue um, that helps drink the nectar up. Okay, but it's still really interesting to think about how the other insects eat too. Let's see. Ooh, Simon is wondering what he sees is an egg, the picture with the white flowers. So, yeah, so there, I'm, I didn't notice that before. Logan, I wonder what that powdery stuff is. Yeah, so Logan, that's a great place to kind of continue our program. So all this powdery stuff, the yellow stuff, if that's what you're wondering, Logan, that's pollen. And that's what we're going to really focus on today, right? So all of these friends are different insects, right? So let's talk a little bit about what we wondered, right? There was a whole lot of wonderings, and I see there are some still coming in, right? But Logan, I love your wondering friend, and let's talk a little bit about that. So the yellow stuff, that's pollen, right? And all these different flowers have pollen to help them make new flowers and new fruits and trees and things like that. So all of these little insects are covered in pollen, right? That's the yellow stuff. So how do they get covered in it, right? That's what we're going to really spend a lot of our program on today, okay? Looking at how we can create a model to represent this. So before we do that, one of the things that I wondered was how all of these different insects, particularly honeybees, because I love honeybees. I think they really play an important part in our environment, um, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. But how do they see? And if my friends have ever wondered this too, it's really interesting because bees, they have to find the flowers. So do they look the same to us as they do to them? And that was one of my big wonderings. So I did a little bit of reading together with some of my other friends here at the Science Center. And this is some of the things that we noticed. So we have eyes, and those eyes help us see everything around us. Now bees also have eyes too. Okay, Bees' eyes are a little bit different. Bees have five eyes. Okay, They have two large compound eyes. Right, that are usually on the sides of their heads. Now, eyes of a boy honeybee and a girl honeybee are a little bit different, right? They look different, okay? But they have two eyes on the sides of their heads and three little ones on the very top of their heads. Now, the compound eyes on the sides of their heads, that helps them see light, okay? Whereas the three little eyes on the tops of their heads that helps them notice movement, okay? But what, do, what does a flower look like to them? That was really, really cool. And if you've never noticed this before, it's really interesting because the flower we see might look like this, right? But to a bee and to a honeybee, the same flower looks a little bit different. It looks kind of like this. So even though it looks like a completely different flower, friends, that's the same flower. It's just the way the bee sees it, okay? And what you might be noticing is that this middle portion is kind of highlighted, right? Now, that middle portion, friends, is called a nectar guide. And that basically, like the name kind of suggests, it guides the bee towards where the nectar is, right? And towards where the pollen is. Now plants, that's really interesting too, because the plant needs the help of the bee, and the bee needs the help of the plant, so they kind of help each other, right? So this neck, this is the way the bees see the same flower that we see. 
Now we can look at other plants and other flowers, right? So this is a different flower, and that's how we see it. But a bee would see that same flower like this, and we can see sort of the nectar guide right in the middle. Now bees see a whole lot of the same colors that we do, but they also have some difficulty seeing reds. Okay, but the thing about since they can't see reds, they do see something called the ultraviolet spectrum, right? And they see ultraviolet light, which is how they can see these nectar guides. And that's how they find the place, the perfect place to land when they're going to flower to flower, which is really interesting. Okay, so let's take a look. I see if my friends, if you have questions, feel free to f ask them. I might not see them, okay, right now, but feel free to ask them, friends, as we're going through the program. I will also make sure to take some time at the very end to answer the questions that come up too. So if you want to save your question just so that I can see it, friends, you can save it towards the end. That way we don't miss your question, okay? Okay, so cool. So that's how bees see flowers. Now, the really important thing about all of these different ways that bees see and their role in our environment is because a lot of the food that we eat every single day is thanks to bees, uh, particularly honeybees, that help pollinate flowers. Okay, so everything that you're seeing on your screen right now is thanks, we have it thanks to honeybees. So things like raspberries and watermelon, right, and pumpkins, right, and avocado and kiwi, all of these wonderful things that we eat is thanks to honeybees and their role they, they, they play in our everyday lives, okay? So that's why it's really great to make sure we're taking care of our honeybees and keeping them safe. Cool. And especially my favorite, one of my favorite things I noticed was cotton. I didn't think cotton was um, made by, or we have cotton because of honeybees. So like my shirt, it may be the shirt you're wearing, or the pants or the sweater, right, or the dress you're wearing, it has cotton in it. So that's thanks because of honeybees. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. Okay. So friends, we've been doing a lot of talking about the role honeybees play and some really interesting noticings and wonderings about them. What we're going to do today is we're going to do an experiment. Now, one of our friends asked in the beginning, what materials are we going to need? Are we going to need materials? So those materials are on your screen now. So they, you might want to grab some kind of container Okay, and you might want to try and grab some of the materials listed on the screen, like a small balloon, a pipe cleaner, a clothespin, a pom-pom. Now, just to be perfectly honest, friends, Mr. Kango tried to go shopping this weekend to gather all these things for myself for our program today, and I couldn't find all of our things, right? And so it's okay if you don't have everything on the screen. Because what we're going to do, friends, is we're going to show you a recording of the experiments that we're talking about. This way you can always watch it and follow along from home. Okay, and if you have time now or later today or even next week or some time that works well for you and your family, you can always try the experiment again. Okay, this way you can still do some of our learning too. Okay, so the only thing that I couldn't find really was pipe cleaners and pom-poms. So instead of pipe cleaners and pom-poms, what I decided to use for my experiment today was I used a cotton ball, right? Because it's kind of fuzzy like a pom-pom, right? I did find a clothespin, right? And I couldn't find a pipe cleaner, so I used a plastic spoon, right? So if you were part of our program where we talked about catapults, right? This is the same kind of spoon from our catapult program. So I just reused it. Okay, cool. So you don't need everything listed here, right? It's great if you did find them, right? 
but if you didn't find them and uh, you don't have to feel upset or like you're going to miss out friends because it's still great that you're trying your best and following along from home. Now what we're going to want to do inside our container, whether it's a cup or a little Tupperware container, right friends? We want to try and put our materials, something for those materials to test with, meaning the things on the bottom that are pretend pollen, you can either use ground pepper, right? So here's Mr. Kango's ground pepper that I was using. I got it from ShopRite. Or you can use little bits of paper, right? And you want to try and cut the paper super, super small. So Miss Rosa, one of my good friends here at the Science Center, she shared with me that we want to make it about the size of confetti. So if you've ever interacted with confetti or used confetti friends, uh, you want to try and make it that tiny. So super, super, super small. Okay. All you're going to basically do, friends, is put those materials you want to test inside your container and shake them around like this. Okay, and we'll talk about what we're going to notice after it and why we're shaking it like that. But we're going to take one object at a time and we're going to put it inside each contain um, in our container to see which ones hold a lot of that black pepper or that paper and which ones do not, right? So we might take turns, right? I might put my cotton ball in my container and shake it up. Then I'll see, take it out and take a look. I might do the same thing with my clothespin, put it inside, shake it all about, right? And take a look and do the same thing with my spoon. Now, like I said, I have some videos to show our friends right so you can watch from home so let's take a look at those so the first is our pom-pom so this is luckily thanks to a lot of our friends here at the science center that recorded it so kindly so let's take a look so you can see it goes right inside and in this video we're using black pepper so you're gonna shake it around and that's kind of simulating the bee moving around the flower Right? So as the bee lands, it kind of rustles and tries to find the nectar, right? And those little bits of black pepper are pollen. So we see on the screen, a little bit got stuck, right? Not a whole lot, but a little bit. So it kind of worked. I would say it worked, but it kind of worked. Let's see the pipe cleaner. So instead of a pipe cleaner, if you don't have a pipe cleaner, this one you might want to use like a plastic spoon. Let's check the pipe cleaner now, too. So it looks like it rustled around, too, just like a bee would, right? And I don't see anything on our pipe cleaner, right? So if you tried your spoon, you can share right with us whether or not you saw anything but most likely we didn't see anything right so that was our result for that one but let's try the other two so the other two left over are our clothespin and our balloon so let's try the clothespin first So clothespins going around, right? And it's again just like a bee would. So if you're trying this from home, right, you can certainly go ahead and shake it all about, right, and see what you notice. But looking at the video, friends, I'm not seeing any pollen or that black pepper on it, right? There's nothing really there. And then let's try our balloon. So our balloon goes inside. And it's shaking. And in a moment, we're going to take it out. And I want my friends to take a close look at our balloon, right? We zoomed up as best we could. But if you look really closely, you can see a whole lot of the black pepper on the sides, right? And there it is again. 
I'm using my cursor just to point out to where it is, right? So we can see that our balloon did work really well. Just like a regular bee, right, the balloon helped us collect some of that pollen, that pretend pollen, which in this case was our black pepper, right? So it got stuck to the bee or our balloon just like a regular bee would. So the results of our experiment, and if you're trying it from home, maybe you notice the same thing, but the results of our experiment today were this. So our cotton ball or pom-pom worked, right? It kind of worked. We definitely saw some bits of pollen, right? Our pipe cleaner didn't work really well, and that's okay, right? Part of doing an experiment is identifying what things work and what things don't work. So it's okay if it didn't work, right? Because that helps us uh, begin a new wondering, like why didn't it work, right? Now, what about our clothespin? Our clothespin didn't work but our balloon definitely worked. And probably out of all the ones we would say that our balloon was the best, okay? Now, what I love to talk about, friends, is think about why our balloon worked really well, right? So our balloon worked really well, and that's a great way to represent a bee, but why does it work really well and why is it a good representation of a bee? So what I'm going to do, friends, is I'm going to sh uh, change the screen you're seeing from the picture that's currently on there to just myself so that we can walk through an experiment together. Okay? So it's going to be kind of the same thing, but this way we're going to talk along along it. So, so far we've been doing our experiment, right, with a little container and things inside the container to represent pollen, right? So Mr. Kango has two containers, one with paper, so that's another way to represent pollen, and one with black pepper. Now, what you're going to notice, friends, and I'll hold it up so maybe you can see it. Yeah, it looks like you can see it. There's little bits of red stuff now in my container, because I wanted to make my container a little bit fun, so I put black pepper, but I also put paprika, because I just like, I like the name. Um, so you can try it too from home. You can add black pepper or something else, right, to help make your experiment fun and interesting and engaging for you too, right, as long as you ask an adult, right, for help if you need some. So just like we talked about, you're going to take your material, whatever you're testing. So in this case, I want to test my cotton ball. Right? And you're just going to put it inside, and you're going to shake it, shake your container. Now like we talked about, this is kind of simulating the movement of that bee inside the flower, right? As it's rustling through to try and find all the nectar it can, it's moving inside that flower. And when it leaves, right? It ga gathers and has all of that pollen connected to it. So let's take a look at our cotton ball. And you can see I like the paprika because it really helps me notice, right, how much pollen got on my cotton ball. Because now you can see kind of it has a reddish tint to it, right? So it did get covered in pollen, right? But the really cool thing about this experiment and the way that helps me understand how bees get so much pollen stuck to them is if we use paper. Now, one thing we might be thinking is, well, Mr. Kango, the pepper got stuck to the cotton ball because it's fuzzy, right? So it has all that space and all that fuzziness for the pepper and the stuff to get stuck to it. But what about paper, right? Paper doesn't have a way to get inside all of these fuzzy things, right? So this is a really interesting way to help us understand what's really happening with bees. So when a bee flies through the air, right? And you know what, actually, before we talk about it, let's do the experiment. <laughs> Getting ahead of myself, I'm really excited. So you're going to take your container, in your cotton ball, right, and you're going to put it inside, and then you're just going to shut it, right? And if you have a cup at home, you can do it too. You just take that cup, 
and you put the cotton ball inside and then you cover it with both hands like this and you shake it okay but I'm going to use my Tupperware container now you're going to shake it as best you can now if everything works really well what we should see is all the paper stuck to the cotton ball but sometimes in science our experiments don't go exactly as planned but let's take a look right so so after it's all done and that bee is done moving around the flower once we take it out we should see that pollen stuck to it so in this case the paper is that pollen right so we can see all that paper got stuck to our cotton ball which is our bee right so how did this happen it's not the same as our pepper right so one thing to do is to think about it a different way friends so a bee right a bee is nice and fuzzy now as a bee is flying through the air right it's flying through the air and the air is hitting its body now as it's flying through the air and the air is hitting its body it's creating a lot of friction so if my friends have never heard that word before if you take your hands and kind of go like this right the more you rub your hands together the warmer your hands are going to come and you're going to feel some heat in your hands right now what happens when that bee is flying through the air it creates friction just like we notice with our hands right that's friction too right it creates a charge so as it's flying a lot of these tiny things called electrons fly off the bee leaving our bee covered with something called protons and comes a really positive charge now the funny thing about flowers is they have a mostly negative charge okay so since our bee is positive and our flower is negative if my friends have ever played with magnets right if you stick a positive end with a negative end they connect they stick together right so it's the same thing right because if you take a positive end and another positive end you try and stick them together kind of they kind of push against each other right so the bee as it's flying towards the flower and it's mostly positive when it lands on that flower which is negative all that pollen just sticks right to our friend and the pollen sticks to it and gets stuck right so that is how our bee gets covered in pollen okay pretty cool right yeah so one thing friends that helps us understand why the balloon works really well is that when the balloon is moving around just like our bee the balloon is releasing lots of electrons right and it's creating a lot of static electricity right and that static electricity helps the pepper or, or in case the paper too connect to the balloon whereas things like your clothespin they don't hold that charge as readily right what you might have noticed with your clothespin if you tried it the paper or maybe the the black pepper might have gotten stuck in some of the creases of it and that's okay too that happens in nature right things get stuck in places right pollen gets stuck in places but mostly with bees it's great to help uh, use or the reason the balloon works really well is because of this idea of static electricity okay cool now one thing that I thought was really interesting to share friends and to help us recap right because we're nearing the end of our program I know it went really super quick one thing to help us recap friends right is to take some uh, look again at some of the pictures and some of the ways that bees see flowers differently than we do right so let's take a look at some of those pictures I'm going to change the screen so you can see some of these flowers so a bee might see this flower right or we see this flower looking this way right and it's really pretty right but bees they see in a different way than we do they can see ultraviolet light right ultraviolet light is kind of the same thing if you ever go to the beach or you go outside and your mom and dad is or your family saying put on sunscreen that sunscreen is helping protect your skin 
from ultraviolet light. Okay, so bees can see that ultraviolet light. So instead of our flower looking like this to them, they kind of see that same flower like this. Okay, but some scientists, and I found this really cool, some scientists think that bees can also see these electrical fields that we talked about, right? How the bee and the flower have these positive and negative charges. So some scientists think that bees can see this negative charge that a flower has, and that also helps them guide themselves and their bodies to the flower too. So that same flower might look like this. Isn't that really cool? <laughs> I kind of like that one. Kind of looks like a night light. It looks really interesting, right? So that same flower looks like this. Now, some some of uh, the scientists are thinking that maybe this flower can turn off and on this charge, and that helps bees go away, right? Or the charge might change, right? Because when a bee goes down to a flower and collects that pollen, the charge their body created makes the flower a different charge. So other bees can know when that same flower was visited by another bee, right? So they don't go to that flower because all the pollen is gone, right? That's pretty cool, right? Okay, so I did a whole lot of tucking. <laughs> um, you can tell I really like animals. Um, so friends, let's go back to that PowerPoint. So now that we know, right, that bees have this charge, right, that when they're flying through the air, right, they create lots of friction from the air, which makes them their body nice and positive, right, and when they land on a flower which is negative, right, all that pollen sticks to their body, kind of like a magnet, right, so it's really cool. This is going to help us, right, create a model that can really explain our thinking, right, but what do they do when they reach that f their hive? So bees, as they're flying and collecting this, this pollen, they collect that pollen in little parts of their legs, uh, where it's like there's a pollen basket. Now that pollen basket is located by their shins. So if you've ever gone rollerblading, so Mr. Kangle used to go rollerblading when I was little, um, and I always wore shin pads. So if you've ever worn shin pads, it kind of covers the part of your body where your bottom half of your leg is, right? That's your shin. Um, so bees have their baskets, their pollen baskets, by that area of their leg, their shin, okay? It's not called their shin, but it's, it's that part of their leg, okay? And they collect that pollen and put it in their baskets until they fly back to the hive and they put that pollen inside a little honeycomb. They take out the water and they put it in there to store until they need it, right? And that creates a great source of protein and fat for all the baby bees that are in the hive too, right? Now that pollen basket kind of looks like this. So here is that pollen basket on the side. Kind of looks like it's carrying two bas backpacks on its legs, right? There's one bas backpack and there's the other. And these are the honeycombs, right? So they put all that pollen, right, inside there and they take out the water, right? And that creates this really nice, rich food for all the baby bees, but also all the other bees for over the winter time because bees hibernate. They stay in, the win in their hive during the winter time. Okay, so they need all that food to survive during the winter. All right, really cool stuff. So anyway, um, all these things, the important thing, friends, is all of these wonderings and these uh, noticings, they help us create a model that really represents how that something works. So in this case of the bee, it's a great idea to use a balloon because that can help us explain what's happening with those positive and negative charges, right, that we talked about. So it's, mo it's more than just the fact that the bee's body is fuzzy, right, because we can also use a pom-pom or a cotton ball, 
but to help us explain what's happening when a bee moves through the air, right, and creates that positive charge. And when it lands on a flower, it collects all those things kind of like a big magnet, right? A balloon is a great way to represent that idea, all right? But you can use anything to make your model. It's all about how you represent what you know and what you understand with how that something works. So you can feel, just like the screen says, to be creative, right? And use your imagination, right? So you can use paper and glue, right? I like using glue stick instead of glue glue because the pouring glue gets everywhere, right? So you can draw right on your model. So in this case, you can see, right, it has those two eyes, uh, those two compound eyes, it has those three little eyes, right, and the two antenna and its little bee body, right, and its six legs, right, because it's an insect, okay? So, my friends, I hope that you all had a lot of fun today. Um, what we're going to do before we end, let's take a look. I want to share, friends, with you that if you're looking for more content to try from home, friends, feel free to check out our website, which is lsc.org, uh, and you can find a link to our LSC in the House content page so you can try more experiments at home. So just like we talked about today, that those experiments are going to list for you all the materials you're going to need, right? Um, as well as how to do the experiment and what you should be learning about and uh, some vocabulary to share with friends and family, right? But besides those experiment page uh, or experiments to try, there's a great way to list all the different things that we also have going on here at the Science Center. So a lot of our um, planetarium staffs, their content is up there, as well as our animal videos, and uh, Fred and Colonel Quail's stuff is up there, so there's a lot of stuff for you to watch and engage with um, from home. So, I did a whole lot of talking, friends. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to take a look on Facebook to see if you have any questions. Okay, so if you have any questions, friends, and I probably missed it <laughs> um, if you asked it during our presentation just because I probably didn't see it. Um, you can go ahead and ask it again now and I'm gonna try and see if I can answer it for you. Okay, so I may not have the answer right but I can certainly try and I will let you know if I don't know the answer. Okay, so go ahead if you are going about the rest of your day my friends enjoy the rest of your day if you do have a question, feel free to ask it, okay? But if you're heading out, enjoy the rest of your day. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next time, friends. All right? So let's take a look live on Facebook. Let's see if we have any questions. Oh, thanks, friends. How many different types of bees are there? So um, what I understand, friends, there are honeybees, right? But there's bumblebees and there's different kinds of um, wasps, right? Um, each of these different things, uh, different types, right, of insects and bees, they have different uh, characteristics to them, right? But those are the three I know about so far, okay? Cool. Mmm, so let's see, are bees deadly? So friends, um, one thing to share, I, I don't know about how deadly they are, but friends, if you are allergic to bees, like I'm allergic to bees, friends, make sure you're always kept carrying your EpiPen, so friends can have a really bad allergic reaction to them. Um, but usually bees, their sting is not so bad, unless you're really allergic, so like, like I'm allergic and I have to always carry my EpiPen. Oh, Rocco, I'm glad you thought it was cool, friend. Thanks for stopping by. Enjoy the rest of your day. Oh, bye, Victoria. Thanks for coming, friends. Hmm. So Victoria, I'm not sure. So Victoria asked what 
um, what makes very small pieces of paper more static than big pieces of paper? Mm, I'm not sure, friend. But you know what? I know to make the experiment work really well, it's better to use tiny bits of paper. So I'm not sure. That's a good question. I will have to look that up. How are baby bees, so um, baby bees take about 21 days to go from a baby bee to a full blown bee, okay? Um, and usually all baby bees or bees, right? Um, a lots, lots of bees in a hive, they're usually girl bees, right? And only a few are boy bees. Oh, so yeah, some of our friends noticed that we have bees at the at LSE. I'm sure they're okay, friends. I know there's a lot of our friends from uh, LSE who are on our animal husbandry team who take care of all of our animals, so I know they're okay. Thanks for asking. So Carly asked the difference between a boy bee and a girl bee. So girl bees, one is their eyes. So I was learning that boy bees have their eyes. They're much bigger, their eyes, their compound eyes, and they kind of touch at the very top. Okay. Um, girl bees, they're more separated. Girl bees, honey bees, they have a stinger. Boys do not have a stinger. Okay. And boy bees, Right, their body is a little bit bigger than girl bees. Now, but also, boy bees and girl bees, part of their antenna, so their antenna is kind of like a big arm, right? Uh, they use it to move around, they move it around to smell and taste what's around them and sense what's around them, but their antenna has uh, kind of two big or three big parts, and one of those parts is called the flagellum and it's kind of like your forearm. And their flagellum has different segments to it. Now boys have more uh, segments than girls. Let me, I took a, I wrote it down. Um, boy bees have 11 segments and girl bees have 10. Okay, so those are some of the big differences between boy bees and girl bees. Okay. But girl bees also are the worker bees. They do a whole lot more work than boy bees in a hive. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, you're allergic to pollen. I feel you, friend. I am allergic to pollen, too. Let's see. So, um, yeah, so Dury asked, do, boy, do bees live through the winter? Yeah, so they stay in the hive, friends, and they kind of cuddle up together in what looks like a football. They kind of gather together, and they stay within the hive and use each other's body heat to stay warm. In this way, they, su they can survive. During the winter's time, some of the little bees will go out and spend some time outside the hive, but most of them stay together, okay? And they use each other's body heat to stay warm during the winter time. So they hibernate. Oh, I'm glad, Dina. Thank you so much for your kind thoughts. Bye, Christina. Thank you for joining us. Sophia, if bees are sticky, um, you know, I'm not sure. I don't think so. I think their body is kind of fuzzy, right? But I'm not sure if they're sticky, sticky. That's a good question. Not sure, friend. So Jamie asks, um, how, so bees, usually they live in large groups, they live in hives, right? And these numbers can go from like 35,000 to up to 60,000. And so that, that's usually the max number, okay? So that range. Yeah, Sherry, so 
do bees talk to each other? Yeah, it's really cool. They kind of do little dances to talk to each other and communicate where to find flowers, right? Where to get their food, okay? Where to get water, because they all need these things. And so they use these little dances to communicate to other bees, other worker bees, right? Where to find the flower outside the hive. Okay, so they do like a little, it looks like a uh, eight or an infinity symbol. Okay, and they do that dance to help other bees find where the flowers are. Oh, yeah, I remember Jolie. Yeah, so Jolie, hi, if you're still joining us, I hope you're doing well, and I hope to hopefully see you guys um, when the Science Center reopens. All right, my friends, so unfortunately, that is all the time I have for today. I see there's lots of questions still left. Um, what I'm going to try and do is after we're all logged off, I'll make sure to uh, write those questions down and we'll try and get back to you, friends, with the answer to your question as best we can. But feel free to um, keep letting us know if you have more questions, friends, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, as always, for joining us here live on Facebook. I hope that you all had fun, right? Um, and hopefully we'll see you next Monday. Okay, friends? So until then, enjoy the rest of your day, okay? And thank you again for joining us.